This week on the CNET Tech Review, join us in Austin, Texas for our tour of South by Southwest. Tap out a catchy tune with GarageBand for iPad. I'll count down our top five laptops. And something about Google Chrome and a trailer hitch. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech, plus offer some unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's get started with the good. For the uninitiated, South by Southwest is a collection of conferences and festivals held each year in Austin, Texas to celebrate the convergent worlds of music, film, and interactive content. Last weekend, Brian Tong and I made the trip out to Austin to check out the show, tape an episode of our Buzz Out Loud podcast in front of a live audience, and hit a few of the parties. Here's a little taste of our visit to South by Southwest. Hey guys, Brian Song here. I'm Molly Wood. And we are here in Austin, Texas at South by Southwest 2011. There's a lot of action going on outside, behind us, inside in the conference center, but how do you explain this thing really? Yeah, South by Southwest is totally weird. It's this interactive music film festival. Most people say it's really about the parties. Yeah. It's impossible to explain, so we're just gonna try to show yeah, you. Yeah, we're gonna show you the best way that we can, so check it out. Are you really here for the panels or are you here for the party? Panels, definitely. Um, you can't ignore the music effect and the parties that are going on, but 100% came for the panels first and foremost. What did you come here to check out? I really came to kind of just get a vibe of what's going on, get a little inspiration. I thought I planned really well. I had it all scheduled out on my iPad, on my phone, everything, and then I get here and it all goes to hell. We're in the Screen Burn Arcade right now. Yeah, you guys can check out all of the latest games, some of the ones you haven't seen, and really it's all about getting the good swag. I'm ready to do anything for a t-shirt, even get paddled. Are you ready for this? <laughs> I guess I am. There you go. That, oh! Ah, but I, I want another shirt. Oh, another one. Oh! That's good. Okay. All right, things are starting to wind down. The sun is going down in Austin. The sun is setting, slowly yeah. but surely. You know all the work is actually about to start. Mm -hmm. Because when the sun goes down in Austin, it's party time. All right, this is more like it. Yeah, this is Sixth Street, where all of it's happening here. I mean, if you check out on the right side over here, we've got like a movie screening. They've got this pimped out car, but you have karaoke and live music in almost every place you can imagine. And almost every one of these bars is hosting some kind of party. Party over here, party over there, really yeah. long line over here. I think most people just go around looking for the lights. Yeah, and we're gonna go find one to get in our, our own, right? Yeah. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go. I actually decided the hell with the parties. This is the line I'm getting in. All right, now we're partying. Oh my gosh, what an amazing night here in Austin on 6th Street, South by Southwest. Oh my goodness. I'm exhausted. We party hopped, we met web celebs, and now we oh. gotta go. We gotta no. get up early. It's been great here, so what better way to go home to than, you know, with my lovely girl, Miss Mollywood. Oh, you stop that. You know, you know how we do it. Oh, plus we had to go in one of Austin's famous pedicabs because these dogs are barking. Oh, oh. We'll see you guys. Good night. 
Man, I could have stayed in that country bar all night. Although, as it turns out, I am not an awesome dancer. Oh, and trust me, between the paddling and the bull riding, Ryan was walking a little funny the whole rest of the weekend. You can find Buzz Out Loud in all of our podcasts at cnet.com slash live. I have to say, it's been a busy week. Before I left town for Austin, I had a few minutes to fill in for a vacationing Brian Cooley for the latest edition of the CNET Top 5. This week, we're counting down the best laptops. See if you can guess which one comes in at number one. Say what you will about tablets being the future, this is the present, and laptops ain't going anywhere. I'm Molly Wood, in for Brian Cooley with a CNET Top 5, the best five laptops you can buy right now. So why buy a laptop when tablets are the future of media consumption? Well, maybe because laptops are still the future of getting some damn work done already. If you still like typing, you don't like grease smudges on your touchscreen, and you could use a little more horsepower than an oversized smartphone chip, here are the five laptops that our CNET editors say are the best you can get. Coming in at number five is the HP Pavilion DM1. The main thing we love about this guy, great battery life. And the AMD Fusion platform. It combines that power efficient performance with better graphics than you would normally see in a budget netbook. Because it also costs less than 500 bucks. If it weren't for that HP bloatware, it would be love. At number four, we're going the opposite direction, price-wise and size-wise, but we're sticking with HP. It's the high-end HP Envy 17. The Envy line is HP's premium laptop brand, and the Envy 17 is a sleek aluminum MacBook Pro clone with a beautiful display, high-end audio, plenty of power and performance, and even USB 3.0 for around 1500 bucks. Plus, trust me, I actually own the HP Envy 14, and believe me when I tell you, it's real purdy. In at number three, the 11 inch MacBook Air. The first MacBook Air came off like an overpriced toy for annoying wannabe CEO types. The second MacBook Air came off like a gotta have it. By some reports, Air sales topped 1.1 million in the first three months after launch. The 11 inch model is the stunner too. Unbelievably light and thin, instant on performance and very impressive battery life. Although with a $1,000 price tag, no SD card slot, no backlit keyboard, and a pretty outdated processor, the MacBook Air is still a little more flash than value. But I dare you to use one and not have to have it. In at number two, you'll want to check out the CNET Editor's Choice Toshiba Portage R705. But maybe don't buy just yet. This laptop is described by our editors as being as close to a perfect balance of design, price, and performance as you'll find in a Windows laptop. So what can make it better? Sandy Bridge. The R800 series is coming hopefully very soon. So considering how much we love the R705, the more powerful and efficient Sandy Bridge processors will make the new Portages a total must have. And before we get to number one, I'd like to hear your opinion on whether reports of the laptop's death are greatly exaggerated. Gartner Research reported this week that tablet sales will grow from 15 million in 2010 to 54 million in 2011, and that laptop sales will tank as a result. But I want to know what you think. What are you more likely to buy in 2011, a laptop or a tablet? Tell us in our poll at the CNET TV blog over at blog.cnettv.com. Okay, now it's time for the number one best laptop as rated by our CNET editors. No surprise here, it's the MacBook Pro in any size you want. The 15 inch MacBook Pro is a CNET editor's choice thanks to its new high end processor options, great graphics, and the new Thunderbolt I.O. port. And the 13 inch model may not have the graphics horsepower, but the 2.7 gigahertz core i7 processor is serious business and the battery life is amazing. I know some of you were hoping for a redesign with the new models, but come on, it's not like the MacBook Pro is ugly. And there you have it, the five best laptops available right now or coming soon. Happy shopping, everyone. I'm Molly Wood, and you can find all the CNET Top 5 videos at CNETTV.com. I actually own two of the laptops on that list, the HP Envy and the Air. Can I pick them or what? No matter which laptop you pick, odds are you're going to need a web browser to get any real use out of it. And when it comes to browser experts, look no farther than our own Seth Rosenblatt. Don't believe me? Here's his first look at Google Chrome 10. 
Google exploded onto the browser scene with the open source Chrome in September 2008, and interest in the browser has continued to skyrocket. Chrome's hook has always been its speed, but there's far more to the browser than just fast rendering. Hi, I'm Seth Rosenblatt for CNET, and in this first look video I'll be taking you on a quick tour of what's what in Chrome 10. There's a lot going on under that minimalist interface, so I'm going to talk about just the key features. Check out CNET's how-to videos for a more in-depth look at how Chrome's features work. Google has been touting Chrome 10 as 66% faster than Chrome 9, even with its limited hardware acceleration implementation. There's no doubt that Chrome benchmarks at incredibly fast speeds. Full benchmarks are available at my download.com review of Google Chrome. What's almost as important, though, is that it feels fast. Page load times, especially when only a few tabs are open, feel like there's less than a split second delay from hitting enter to when the site is usable. I have noticed, though, that Chrome does tend to slow down noticeably with more than two dozen tabs open. Your browsing habits may vary, but if you're a tab junkie like me, that can be a really big problem. It can often lead to crashes, too, although that's actually one of Chrome's better features. Plugins like Adobe Flash are sandboxed, so when they crash, they only take down the tab and not the entire browser. Chrome also comes with its own task manager, so you can see the impact of each tab on your system. When you fire up Chrome for the first time, it will take you to your preferred search engine. You can change this in the options menu to your new tab page, which is where a lot of Chrome's action happens. The new tab page has links to Chrome Web Store for Chrome-based apps, thumbnails of your most visited sites, and a list of recently closed tabs. You can tear off tabs to make them their own windows and drag them back into the browser. Right-click on a tab to duplicate the tab, pin it permanently to the left of the tab bar, get multiple closed tab options, reopen a closed tab, or bookmark all your tabs at once. The interface is simple and extremely effective. Navigation controls live on the left, Google's unified location bar and search box, which the company calls the Omnibar, quietly displays search results from your preferred search engine, your history, and instant URL lookups. Extensions get added to the right as icons. You can toggle always displaying the bookmarks bar or having it show only when you open a blank tab in options. Chrome's extension gallery has grown dramatically since its introduction and now has more than 10,000 extensions and themes. Both are restartless, which means that when you install them, you won't have to restart the browser. Sync is a big part of Chrome, and if your life is heavily tied to your Gmail account, you're going to find Chrome extremely convenient. You can sync apps, autofill, bookmarks, extensions, themes, passwords, and preferences. And you can set it for a lower level of security using your Google password, or set up your own higher security sync passphrase. On the safety front, Chrome allows you to disable JavaScript, cookies, images, and will auto-block websites that are known for promulgating phishing attacks and malware threats or are otherwise unsafe. The usefulness of this depends on Google's ability to flag websites as risky, so it's recommended to use an add-on like the Web of Trust. There's also the incognito mode for private trackless browsing, although there's no options menu choice for always opening into incognito. Chrome now comes with a nascent Google Cloud Print, which will allow you to print from the browser to any printer over the air, a useful tool when it works for those few times when you have to print and you're not near a printer. You'd think Google would be greener than enabling you tree killers, but what do I know? The downloads menu isn't particularly robust, but it does expose the download source link and opens in its own tab, keeping the browser tidy. Overall, Chrome Speed remains the kingpin feature along with growing support for future web tech like HTML5, hardware acceleration, and advanced standard support. People like the browser because it's fast, well supported, and automatically updates frequently with new features. Potential concerns about Google, privacy, and data mining can't withstand the juggernaut of convenience. And for a deeper look at some of Chrome's new features, be sure to check out the how-to videos at CNETTV.com. With your first look at Chrome 10, I'm Seth Rosenblatt for CNET. You can also check out Seth's review of the latest incarnation of Microsoft Internet Explorer, IE9, over at CNETTV.com. All right, we've covered a lot of ground already, so let's take a quick break. But we'll be right back with more tech review right after this.
Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Continuing on in the good. So, do you have your iPad 2 yet? If so, you might be trying to figure out what to do with your iPad 1. Well, before you turn it into a coaster, Eric Franklin has some tips for transferring all your data over to the new one. Hey guys, Eric Franklin here, and for those of you looking to transfer data from your current iPad to your brand new and hot iPad 2, you're in luck for two reasons. One, you get to look at this mug here for the next few minutes, and two, this is a very simple process, which is probably why they chose me to do this one. Huh. All right, anyway, first step, connect your old iPad to your PC or Mac iTunes should open automatically, but if it doesn't, simply open iTunes. Your iPad may begin to sync with iTunes, however, if it doesn't, simply locate your iPad under Devices in the left menu window, right click or control click it, then choose Backup. After a few moments of running through a number of steps, the syncing process will end. You'll know for sure it's ended when your iPad no longer states Sync in Progress. Unplug your old and busted iPad and plug in your new hotness. iTunes will then ask you to register your new iPad if you haven't already. Then iTunes will prompt you to either set up as a new iPad or restore from a backup. Choose restore from a backup and select the backup you just created, which should have your iPad's name as well as the time and day in which it was last synced. Click continue. Once the restore process is complete, your iPad 2 will reboot. iTunes should redetect it and will then begin to transfer settings and data to your new iPad. Now to be absolutely sure you have all your apps, movies and music, select the iPad in the menu just like before. Now in the upper nav, check the type of data you want transferred to your new iPad like apps, music, movies and so on. Then click apply your iPad will sync again. This may take a while depending on how many apps you have. Just be patient and once it's done, your new iPad should have all the same data as your old one. You can then throw the old one away and await to repeat this process when the iPad 3 launches. Once again, this is Eric Franklin and I hope you enjoy your new hotness. As for your old iPad, might I recommend selling it at gazelle.com or you can donate it at the Apple Store for Teach for America. Put it to good use in the classroom. And on that good deed note, let's turn our attention to the bad. This week, I mean bad as in badass. Among all the nifty things the iPad 2 can do, one of the coolest has to be the ability to create music with the new version of GarageBand. Jason Parker is here to tell us why it really is one bad app. Welcome to Tap That App. I'm Jason Parker and this is the show where we cover the hottest apps in the mobile space. Along with the release of the iPad 2 on March 11th, Apple released an iPad version for popular Mac app GarageBand. GarageBand already has a long history on the Mac, letting people use intuitive controls and a huge library of instruments and pre-recorded loops to create songs. But with the iPad version, Apple needed to come up with creative ways to record music using only a touchscreen interface, and we think they did an amazing job. Just as a general overview, GarageBand offers several touch instruments, guitar amps and effects, 8-track recording and mixing, more than 250 loops to play with, and you can export AAC files of your projects through email or add them to iTunes. You start by creating a new song, then choose your first instrument. GarageBand offers instruments you can play in real time like their real-world counterparts, but you also have the option to play smart instruments that do most of the heavy lifting for you. One neat feature is that every instrument has its own specific theme, giving all of them their own feel as you play. Using the smart keyboard, for example, lays out all your chords in the chosen key. This means that just about whatever you press will probably go together in a song. You also can change the key by touching the wrench in the upper right corner. Using a combination of bass notes on the bottom and chords at the top, it's easy to create a nice sounding song even if you have very little musical experience. Similarly, the smart guitar offers a different layout that lets you play chords with a swipe of your finger. 
You have the ability to play individual notes and actually bend guitar strings for your big rock solos. All of the smart instruments also come with a few pre-recorded segments, so you can just tap the key and let the app play for you. Drums can be played manually, and you can choose from both standard drum kits and drum machine type layouts. Or, like the other instruments, you can choose smart drums to make things easier. Simply place drum set items on the grid to experiment, or hit the dice icon for a random layout. Once you've been inspired by some of the instruments, you can record a couple of tracks, then look at the track layout section to add or remove tracks, manage track volume, and play with effects like reverb, track panning, and echo. As you become more advanced, you can also use quantization tools to match up complex tracks to cover up your less than perfect human rhythm. But maybe I'm just speaking for myself. The track screen is also where you'll find GarageBand's pre-recorded loops. Once you find something you like by instrument, genre, and other descriptors, just drag and drop the loop onto your track screen to add it to your song. I created this song on the way to work this morning in carpool. Frankly, with tons of uniquely designed instruments, a smart touch interface, and tools that make song creation easy, it's a miracle to me that this app is only $4.99, and there's plenty more we haven't shown in this video. So far, I can't get enough of GarageBand, so I definitely recommend you tap this app. And tap it, and tap it again. But try to tap in rhythm, guys. How are we ever going to make it as a band if you... Sorry, I got a little caught up in the moment. Like I said, GarageBand is only $4.99 in the iTunes App Store, and definitely worth your money, even if you only have a passing interest in creating music. That's it for today's show, but if you have any suggestions, send them to tapthatapp at cnet.com. I'm Jason Parker. Thanks for watching. That is a pretty catchy tune that Jason composed. Not too shabby, Mr. Parker. All right, let's go ahead and check out this week's bottom line. When the iPad 2 went on sale on Friday, Donald Bell immediately awarded it the honor of an editor's choice recommendation. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. Instead, I want you to focus your attention on an editor's choice award winning mouse. Yes, I said mouse. Hi, I'm Rich Brown, senior editor for CNET.com. Today we're going to take a look at the Editor's Choice winning Mad Cat's Cyborg Rat 9. So this right here is one of the most expensive gaming mice we've ever seen. It comes in at $150, so it's definitely for the more committed uh, PC gamers out there. That said, this is also one of the most customizable mice we've ever seen, and it's also a great performer. We recommend it to anybody looking to spend a lot of money on an input device for gaming. So the Rat9 comes with a lot of features we expect in high-end gaming mice these days. It has a 5600 DPI laser sensor. That means it's very fast and very accurate. Now this is a wireless mouse, but Mad Cats does sell a wired version for a little bit less. Now this button right here lets you move through various DPI settings so that you can make the mouse more or less sensitive as you're playing. You can also use the included driver software to customize those settings so you can really tweak the feel of the mouse to exactly how you'd like it. When we flip it over, you can see that down the middle here, there's a series of weights that come up on this post. You can actually unscrew this cap here, take the weights off, and set the weight of the mouse how you want it. That's actually a nice little feature, and it really helps sort of improve the overall feel of the mouse. The cap of the post actually doubles as an Allen wrench, which lets you adjust various points on the mouse to really make it feel good in your hand. Now on the thumb side of the mouse, so you can use the Allen wrench to move this piece here either up and down, or you can loosen it so that it comes out at an angle. That gives you a better position for your thumb potentially on the two side buttons, as well as this red button here. Now this red button is actually something we haven't seen before. The idea is that when you're playing a shooting game and you have a sniper rifle, say you want to run around really quick to get a position, you want to have a nice fast cursor control so you can see where you're going. But then when you zoom in on somebody, you might want a little bit better control. So when you push that button, it lowers the DPI, the laser sensor, a little bit and lets you get a better beat on whoever you're trying to track. And when you get to the pinky side of the mouse, you'll see that there's another screw here. You can use the Allen wrench to take this piece off, and Mad Cats includes two other pinky pieces you can put in. They have different textures and different sizes, so it lets you customize that side of the mouse as well. Mad Cats also includes a carrying box to let you put all the various pieces that you're not using aside. Now for the last point of hardware customization, you can see this wrist rest here. There's a little tab on the bottom, push it in, and you can slide the wrist piece right off. You get two other wrist piece options. Two of them sit up a little higher on this track, one sits closer to flush. What's cool about this track is that you can not only slide in new wrist pieces depending on the kind of feel you want there, you can also set them to be longer or shorter. So if you've got a bigger hand or a smaller hand, 
you can adjust the wrist piece so it fits perfectly. Now rounding out the mouse, you've got a lateral scroll button here. That's actually sort of an awkward design. It's not the most natural feel. Uh, kind of like Logitech's version where there's a lateral scroll wheel built into the main scroll wheel via a tilting function. But one thing we love about this mouse is that it actually comes with two batteries. So you can charge the second one while you're using the other. Now it comes with a charging station that also acts as a USB receiver. Pop the battery in there. And this hole up here holds a cylinder that holds extra weights when you're not using them. So there's a lot going on with the RAT9. It's one of the most customizable mice we've ever seen. It's got some features we've never seen before, and it also has great performance. It really sort of justifies that $150 price tag, which is why we give it an Editor's Choice Award. So I'm Rich Brown, and this is the Mad Cat Cyborg RAT9 Wireless Gaming Mouse. The bottom line this week, that is awesome. I don't even know what else to say, except I have to have one. A mouse. All right, folks, that's our show. We'll be back next week with a brand new edition of CNET Tech Review. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. See you next time, and thank you for watching.